with Agnes, the presenter of Sickle Cell Talks with Agnes. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So stay tuned because every week we'll be posting videos about any topic in sickle cell disease. We don't have set days yet, but just turn on the post notifications for you to be notified every time we post a video. Thank you and stay tuned. If you've got any questions, get in touch with me on social media or social media platforms. Thank you. At this point, uh, I'm going to call uh, Dr. Anthony Greenway. So if you go through the brochures again, we are not going to give you a full bios of all our experts and our, our caregivers and uh, people affected on the panel. Please go through the brochure again. And uh, Dr. Greenway, just quickly, Dr. Greenway has been our, our doctor for, for the time that my daughter was uh, treated with sickle cell disease. And she's still part of, of I, I call her that she's part of the family because we've known her since 2013. So Dr. Greenway, please take it up. Thank you so much. Great. Can you hear me okay, Agnes? And can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can hear Great. you. Okay, that's my slides. So my name is Nancy Greenway, as Agnes said. Um, some of my top my um, information has been beautifully covered by our previous presenters, so I'll skip through that in the interest of time. I think this is well known to our audience is that sickle cell disease is a very severe condition for sufferers and something that we really need to focus on in, in, in terms of improving health outcomes for individuals who are affected and their families. So we've had a very nice description of the um, some of the clinical manifestations. I won't go through those again, but I think thinking about things in terms of acute and chronic is one of the main ways that I often think about sickle cell. But I also just want to remind everyone that children and adults are not the same. And that's obviously my job as the paediatrician. But as Joy alluded to, some of the problems that we see in children and adults are very different. So problems like the dactylitis and problems like the swollen spleen that was very well described problems like particular infections and, and a high risk of stroke are really some of the problems that we see often in children um, and, and need sort of uh, very good attention to make sure that these don't cause lasting problems for people, at, for sufferers of children, uh, sufferers of sickle cell as they, um, and to ensure that they sort of reach adulthood and, um, uh, you know, with the minimal complications from childhood from their sickle cell. So we're very nicely guided in our therapy by a number of uh, excellent guidelines that are produced in a number of areas in the world. And as you, as you just heard from Professor Barber's talk, you know, a number of these guidelines are now being applied to places in the world where sickle cell numbers are increasing well beyond the, the load we see, certainly here in Australia, but even in the UK and the US. Um, and as we've also heard, uh, the number of treatments continues to increase. And I think that's one of the most exciting things for me as um, a clinician looking after patients with sickle cell. We have many more things in our tool bag, many more um, drugs and medications that may allow us to help patients with sickle cell. So hydroxyurea is, is really has been on the, you know, on as, as part of our sort of treatment for a number of years, but now we have up to four medications that are part of the options if you're in the US, and then we have the options of stem cell transplant in addition to transfusion. So how do we treat sickle cell for children in Australia? So hydroxyurea, we've heard uh, very nicely how important that is, and that's really our mainstay and the main medication that we have available to us. And then different forms of transfusion are important. But really tonight, I wanted to think more about the holistic care that is so important in terms of keeping patients and families well, having them engaged in our clinic so that we can make sure that uh, we have that sort of uh, opportunity to have the best outcome. So. Uh, the, the one comment I would make about hydroxyurea is this drug has been around for a long time and you can see the slide I've just put up there, which is a, one of the sort of early slides describing its effectiveness in this condition back in 2010. And really we're 10 years later and certainly this medication is available in our clinics, but it's taken that time and probably longer to really get it to most of our patients. And, um, and that's, I suppose, been a barrier to getting sort of treatment for many patients. We know, and we've just heard um, beautifully from um, Barbara again, how much evidence we have that this medication works really well across the age ranges. And unlike, unlike many of the drugs that I need to use in paediatrics, there's lots of evidence in children of how effective this drug can be. And that's really exciting for me in terms of being able to talk to patients and families about how we might use this medication to keep people well, keep their children well. Transfusion support, so again, a significant focus on making transfusion safe and available to many patients with sickle cell disease. And I think, um, as, as has been alluded to, for some conditions, particularly neurological, transfusion support is really important and making sure we have good guidelines to guide 
uh, in terms of how we give uh, best and safest transfusion practice has been really important and continues to evolve in the last couple of years. Uh, and again, as, as has been discussed by Joy, this um, it's not really a new technology, but using red cell exchange and having this option for treatment in many of our clinics has also revolu revolutionised treatment for many children and young adults with sickle cell disease. One of my most important jobs in the clinic is to keep my patients well and keep them at home with their families. And so really a lot of the, a lot of the activity that we do is about screening and prevention. And so my job is to make sure that everyone gets to 18, graduates from my clinic, and then I send them up, up the road to doctors like Joy or Carly Mason at the Royal Melbourne. So, you know, in terms of guiding how we screen and prevent some of these complications, many of these things are really important. I just had a bit of a think to, when thinking about uh, talking to you all tonight about what were some of the biggest challenges for the paediatric cohort. And I think um, this uh, ties in well with many of the, the, the topics that Barbara has discussed. So we have little people with big challenges. So missing school because of pain, because of appointments, because of coming in to see annoying me who's doing the screening. And that really takes a toll, I think, on members of the family, but also our the children that we, we care for. We know a number of children have significant learning difficulties and these are often silent if we don't pay really good attention to finding out how everyone's going at school. And that's often related to problems such as silent brain injury. If you're in chronic pain, it's really hard to concentrate and to go to school and do your best. And I think these are, are really important things for us to be cognizant of as the clinicians looking after patients with sickle cell. And we know, as I showed previously, stroke has a much higher proportion or much affects a much higher sort of percentage of patients in the paediatric age group. So it's a really important part of my job is to make sure we're screening for that. One of our other biggest challenges is if sickle cell is not well known and we have teachers and school nurses and other parents who don't know what sickle cell is and that has a significant impact in terms of making sure we get best educational outcomes for our patients. One of the other biggest problems that causes significant psychosocial distress, I would, I would say, is the problem of enuresis or bedwetting. And, um, you know, we know why this happens, but it's a really hard thing to treat. And it's really challenging for a 15 or 16 year old to have problems where they can't go on a sleepover or can't go to camp because they wet the bed. As I mentioned, some of our practical challenges is the rareness of this disease relatively. And so access to care in Australia um, can be challenging and making sure we have consistent and equitable care for patients who may be needing to be seen in non-sickle cell centres making sure we have technical expertise to ensure that the screening process goes well and that we have full access to all of these um, treatment modalities. Access to medications, can you believe even in 2020 in Australia, really we have difficulty getting access to things we would say are standard, such as hydroxyurea, but in forms that are appropriate for children. And the costs are substantial, and I think these costs are not necessarily monetary, but relate to um, you know, employment and loss of productivity and needing carers leave in addition to costs of travel and medication. I think it's really important and one of my jobs as the paediatrician is not just the patient in front of me, it's the family around me, the family around my patient. So thinking about mental health and siblings and families and the impact this has on them is really important. But I think the future is really promising. One comment I wanted to make is many of those drugs you've heard so um, beautifully presented by um, Joy and um, Professor Baba, you know, these drugs are coming through much more quickly. So that sort of 10 year um, gap I mentioned with hydroxyurea, I think is unlikely to be the same for many of the medications that are now becoming available. The improvement in transfusion medicine is similarly happening at a very quick rate, and that's really promising and important for us. And we've heard already about bone marrow transplant and gene therapy. Um, this slide's just to remind me to tell you that we know so much more now than we did 10, 15, 20 years ago about the other aspects of sickle. So it's not necessarily all about the red cell. There's white cells and platelets that are really sticky. There's parts of the blood clotting system that are also affected. And this knowledge is really important to help clinicians and scientists develop other targets in sickle cell. I'm not going to go through these in any detail, and certainly Joy's alluded to a number of them, but the way that we implement this in the clinic is that many it's the capacity to really think about a multi-targeted approach. So rather than just having hydroxyurea, we might have a patient on a number of medications to really try and control their sickle cell and the different aspects um, of this condition for them on their life. We've talked about bone marrow transplant, and I think in addition, this 
treatment is moving rapidly um, into our clinics um, with you know, vast improvements in success with this treatment, although certainly it's a treatment with significant risk. Uh, I think our important job as the clinicians is to really focus on how we help patients and families choose the right patient for a bone marrow transplant. And I think um, that's, that, that's one of the really important steps for us as clinicians. Gene therapy, we've, we've heard also is a really important um, new technology that's coming and we'll, you know, particularly where this fits is this may well be something that's uh, on offer to patients who may not have a, a bone marrow donor. And so that, that's about a, only about a quarter of our patients will have a sort of matched sibling donor. And at the moment, so gene therapy may well be an option for them. I just wanted to finish, you know, highlighting how important partnerships such as the partnerships that um, the clinicians in this group have with ASCA um, are, and it's really important in terms of helping us move some of this science into the clinic, but making sure we're listening to our patients and making sure that what we think is important is really what's important to um, the sickle cell community. Some of our local challenges in Australia, just to touch on, relate to some of the um, aspects that Joy mentioned. So the gen genetic diversity of our population really affects um, how we, uh, how sickle cell may be manifest and our population is often quite different to the cohorts that we hear described in the UK or the US or even, even in Africa, who are much more similar often. That lack of data has been a real problem, but we are trying desperately to address that as soon as we can. And because we don't have neonatal screening, the on ongoing problem related to late presentation of sickle cells, so children who miss out on the early care that's so essential. So we did develop this group that, as Joy mentioned, this is the Australian Sickle Cell Working Group, a group of clinicians, nurses and ad advocates and um, uh, also some um, pharmaceutical companies who got together last year to really think about how we might approach this, pro this um, problem in Australia. Um, and where do we go from here? So this, this slide, the slide on the left is the um, World Sickle Cell Day that Agnes uh, was really probably the birth of ASCA, I suspect, back in 2000 and she might have to tell me, 14 or 15? Uh, um, I think it's 14, 14. 14, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and, the slide, and the photo on the right is my team at the Children's Hospital today on World Sickle Cell Day. So there's a whole group of clinicians, lab scientists, hematologists, apheresis staff, day medical staff, who are also important in terms of um, providing care for patients with sickle cell. And this is how much we've grown. Um, and as you can see, the field of um, medicine and science and patient advocacy around sickle cell is continuing to grow at that rate. So I think that's incredibly impressive. And I think uh, we look forward to embracing this opportunity and future opportunities to work together. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Greenway. Thank you so much.